why we dream. I had a dream recently that might explain why we dream. And a little bit about the history of dreams. There'll be a bit of science in this. Um, it's like a, a dentist. There'll be a little bit of discomfort. It'll soon be over. And then we'll talk about this new notion that, that I have uh, come up with. That's a testable hypothesis about why we dream. For thousands of years, dreams were uh, visitations from beings that uh, were not in our everyday life or animal spirits and it, art was was um, themed about that quite often and it was mysterious. It was cryptic and therefore people wanted to decode it because that's what people do, we're storytellers. Here's a dream that Salvador Dali had uh, and he had a very interesting technique that you can all try. He would take a bowl, a metal bowl and a metal spoon and after a nice big meal, he'd sit outside and he'd start to fall asleep. And when he let go of the spoon, it would jangle into the big bowl and he would awaken and take it, write down his dream imagery or sketch it out. He didn't take any drugs or even alcohol, but he had all this wonderful imagery that we're familiar with. That's his wife being pounced upon by these, these uh, tigers. And um, it wasn't until these guys that dreams were understood to be self-generated. There was a period in the 1850s to 1900 that the brain and the psyche merged. It was becoming clear that we are, our psyches are our brains. And so Freud said, well, what does that mean? Well, one thing he developed was a theory of the mind that said that we have a sensor and there are lots of, of unconscious motives and desires that can't come up to consciousness. When we dream, that sensor uh, is, becomes a little bit porous and, and symbolic fears and desires come pouring through. Uh, his his uh, one-time colleague, Jung, felt that a lot of these, these symbolic representations were universal and he would spend several years waking up and painting what he dreamed. Uh, these were secret until about two years ago when his family finally took all of his paintings. There were several that had leaked out, but uh, the, his, his book that he bound in red leather and is, is called The Red Book was finally published and is filled with beautiful dream imagery that does resonate. A, a lot of these kinds of symbolisms we all have in our dreams. He made a bigger deal about the fact that we all um, dream about the same types of things than other people do. But the, the basic notion is that both Freud and Jung basically said it's all internally generated. It's not celestial beings coming to talk to us. And that was a big shift. But the science of dreaming didn't really get going until about the 1950s, mid-1950s, when Nathaniel Kleitman in University of Chicago decided he was studying children. They kept falling asleep and he felt, wait a minute, I have to study this thing of, that takes up so much of our time, sleeping and dreaming. So he built the dream lab. This is not his dream lab. This is a modern dream lab, but his was basically the same. You take little bits of metal and you stick them around the scalp and around the eyes to measure um, electrical activity. And you might measure respiration and some motor activity as well. And then all the leads go into a little panel which amplifies these tiny, tiny sig signals, microvolt signals. And they said, well, let's take a look at this. So uh, they dusted off an old polygraph that was meant for recording muscles, he and a student of his. And they found waves that looked like this. Uh, if you were to close your eyes now uh, and just relax, you would get this alpha rhythm as it's known. The different frequency bands were given different names. This just happens to be uh, an alpha um, rhythm as you're starting to relax. But pretty soon, and you go through this cycle several times a night, and I'll show you what that is like on a, on a subsequent slide. Uh, the, the amplitude diminishes, the waves slow down until you get to this slow wave. In fact, it's called slow wave sleep. It's a very deep sleep. Then all of a sudden, the machine would register this. If I put electrodes on you now and recorded your EEG, your electroencephalogram, it would look like this. But these guys were in the sleep labs uh, asleep, the subjects were. So what did Kleitman do and Azarensky, his student, is they went to the electronic shop and they said, our machine is broken. Something's wrong. These people are sleeping and it conks out a few times a night. Please fix it. They said, the, the guys took a look at the machine and said, no, it's working completely fine. This is really their brain waves while they're sleeping. Associated with this kind of thinking type of everyday brain wave 
they noticed that the eyes were zipping around underneath the eyelids. So they named it rapid eye movement sleep, REM sleep, which we all know about. Interestingly, this is the first time that it was described. Anybody can look at their partner in bed if they have a partner in bed or even their cat or their dog and notice several times a night, eyes are zipping around underneath the eyelids. If you look closely, you can see that. And it was never discussed or recorded. Furthermore, if they woke people up here or, or in stage five, very different phenomena would, would be present. In here, people may uh, some of the time occasionally report that they were dreaming about some mundane everyday thing. I was going to the store to buy a quart of milk. Here are the dreams that when you have them and you awaken are the dreams you tell your friends about. It's like, oh my goodness, I was flying around and then it turned into a spaceship and then, and, and, you know, then we turned into a perfect smile. So, excuse me. So that was interesting that it took until the 1950s for that to be discovered, but at that point, it was off to the races. A typical night sleep looks like this. You go, you have three, four, five periods of REM sleep. You go into the deep modes and all of a sudden REM, you might get jostled a little bit. Another part of REM is that usually all of your musculature except for your eye muscles are completely paralyzed. And as the night progresses, you have more and more REM sleep and less and less slow wave deep sleep. Um, this REM sleep is also known as paradoxical sleep because your brain wave is so active as though it was thinking everyday uh, awaken thoughts, but your body is, is paralyzed. Uh, if you wake up, if, if you were to awaken, oh, well, that's it, oh, here we go. If you were to awaken, uh, there, right there, that's when you tell your friends you had amazing dreams. Um, usually by this time, if you actually slowly awaken and you go through some other things, that's when you wake up and say, I didn't dream last night. But you did dream, you just don't remember them. Uh, about 26 weeks after conception, here's conception, the brain seems like it's completely in REM sleep all the time. The body, the, the, the fetus isn't moving. Uh, it's musculature, but the brain waves are, are looking like, like that stage five sleep that I showed you before. And by the time uh, the, um, your baby is born, uh, you have about eight hours of non-REM sleep. Those are those stage one through four. About eight hours of, of REM sleep. And then about eight hours to, to uh, be a pain in the butt to the parents. And that's the awaken period. And over life, the, period, the percentage of REM sleep goes down, as does the total amount of sleep go down. This guy here is an echidna, a spiny anteater. There are five species known. Uh, and of all the mammals out there, there are, there's one subclass of mammals called the monotremes. Monotremata, they're the earliest mammals. They lay eggs, but they have milk and they have hair and they're warm-blooded. And the echidna, or the spiny anteater and the duckbill platypus are the only uh, extant ones. Their prefrontal cortex analogs are gigantic. They're also the only mammals, the other kinds of mammals being the placental mammals, which are all the animals you're familiar with, and marsupials like kangaroos and armadillos and opossum. Uh, their prefrontal cortices are so large that if you scaled up this echidna brain to the size of a human brain, we would be wheeling around our, our cortex in a wheelbarrow in front of us. So interestingly, these guys don't have REM sleep. All other mammals do. And so there's something about the processing that takes place during REM dreaming sleep that enables this nice kind of compaction of information and neural tissue. Uh, that's a clue that is not completely understood. And in fact, there's a little bit of controversy now. The last couple of years, somebody has recorded something somewhat like REM sleep in the brainstem and the midbrain of the echidna, although the, still those f funny, um, fast, spiky waves on the, on the surface are absent. So here's a human brain with our relatively puny prefrontal cortex. Uh, and the parts that are very interesting in, in terms of, of uh, sleep are the, are the, this is the hippocampus. You might have heard of that because it's famous because that's where memories are formed, stored, and eventually consolidated. Some of these memories over the course of years will be stored elsewhere in the brain. But every day, this guy is very involved during sleep. There's, there's specific kinds of spiky patterns that happen. 
There's playback. If you record some of the cells and you notice when they record, when they go and in what order, while the animal is asleep, they'll play back there. So there's some sort of reverberation going on, and that'll be an important clue uh, in, uh, in terms of what I'm thinking about uh, dreams might be doing, one aspect of dreams. So what is the brain? Well, there's 100 billion of these guys, and there's also 100 billion of associated other non-neuronal cells, but these are neurons, and there are many different morphologies or forms that you'll find them, but they all have similar things. They have this, this dendritic arborization, as it's known, which is uh, a, uh, the receiving part of the, the neuron. Thousands, tens of thousands sometimes of other neurons will, will closely approximate to it and send little chemical signals and things called synapses to it. All that causes some change in the polarity of the membrane and it gets all summed up and a decision is made by the cell body. That's the cell body of that guy. That's the cell body of, of that pyramidal cell. And it makes it all or none decision. It decides, yeah, I've, I've heard what you're saying and I'm going to fire or, I've, or nope, I'm just gonna sit there quiescently. If it does fire, it makes an axon potential down its, its single and solitary axon. And that in turn might go out and touch thousands of other neurons. So that's what your brain is composed of, all brains are. Uh, and this fellow is still the reigning king of neuroanatomy. His name is Santiago Ramon y Cajal. He's a Spanish neuroanatomist. And he would look under the microscope with a newly discovered technique to, to stain slices of brain that would record, that would, that would for some reason still not understood, only stain a very small percentage. If it stained all of them, it would be black because it's so densely matted. But he t t made these beautiful drawings that everybody who's studying neurobiology uh, will, will um, be familiar with because we all still look at those beautiful diagrams that he drew in pen and ink. But he was so prominent that he also made another uh, proclamation, which is that he um, felt all adult brains of a particular species look the same, and he decided brains don't change throughout life. You're born with a certain number of brains, or shortly thereafter, you, you have a certain number of neurons, and then they remain completely uh, static. You might lose some, but you're not going to grow new neurons. And that was what's sort of one of the central dogmas of neurobiology was. Until early 60s, a fellow, Joseph Altman, took a chemical that will only label newly minted cells, brand new cells, because it would, me it would be when DNA is synthesized and then the, the cells split, it would be incorporated into that DNA and you could then image it. Those are what these little tiny dots are. These, these are the new DNA. And he sliced it up and he said, wait a minute, in the brain, in the cortex of a cat, I'm seeing new neurons form there. Well, there's not enough resolution here quite to, to note that, that, to be certain that they're neurons. So people were, were curious about this, but nobody really did much about it until about 18 years later when electron microscopy came along and you can repeat this experiment to show indeed there are new neurons formed. So before the 1990s, the dogma was no new neurons. By the late 1990s and today, certainly, almost all neurobiologists say there are these hot spots, as they're called, the, the dentate gyrus and the hippocampus that grows new neurons all through life. It's called adult neurogenesis. And in the rat, this is a, uh, if you're looking at a rat from the side, its nose would be here, its eyes would be here, its body would be out here. Um, its, its olfactory bulb, which humans don't have, but we have analogous areas, are, are a hot spot, is a hot spot f for a rat. But now, over the last 10, 15 years, there's very, very good evidence that the neocortex, the part of our brain that thinks and feels, uh, has, has um, not quite as much neurogenesis going on, but a fair amount. The amygdala, hypothalamus, all of these areas. So the brain is not the static thing. Yes, connections, as you'll see here, will get stronger or weaker. Another basic tenet that still holds strong by, by Don Hebb was something called Hebb's Hebbian learning. He said, basically, neurons that fire together wire together. Meaning if you have neurons that are close together and they happen to be firing these action potentials 
pretty much at the same time, then they support each other and those connections become stronger. And if they fire at different times, then there's a decay in how tightly coupled they are. This changed everything. That very simple concept changed all of neurobiology because now there's a model for how learning could take place. And today, there's been nothing to disprove this, and there's plenty to prove it. There's been some Nobel Prizes that have been awarded to people who have looked at the biochemistry of the strengthening, and in fact, the genomic changes, the genetic changes that take place uh, during such learning. So this guy is a real hero to neurobiologists, and, and uh, rightfully so. But all of these circuits, that are, a neuron is participating in lots and lots of circuits. And they're reverberatory. I said that the hippocampus will replay some of the, the patterns that, it saw, that the animal saw during the day. And just like, uh, as, as a metaphor, just to get you a, a feel for what, what, what these resonances might be like, uh, there's a wonderful, fun thing that we can all try. If you have a plate of metal and you take a violin bow and bow it while you put some sand, you'll get these nice patterns. Nowadays, it's done by just putting a a speaker underneath it and oscillating it at higher and higher frequencies and it goes and as the tone goes up all of a sudden it snaps into these higher patterns. This is the plate mechanics, the elasticity of the plate and the various shapes having certain resonance modes. It's equivalent to electrical circuits when you tune to 89.9 on your radio it's resonating at a certain frequency and it's filtering out other things. And the, the circuitry in the brain are thought to resonate and keep themselves propagating. When you're, when you're quiet, your brain is still cooking away. It's still doing all sorts of activity, and it's these circuits that are, uh, that are constantly chasing each other, saying, oh, okay, okay, and passing information around, even when there's not that much sensorial input. So now, <laughs> the idea is that I had that uh, is all of these new minted neurons, they go into parts of the brain and they have to learn how to become a, a U neuron. It's just right now it could just sit there, get wired up and try to un figure out how it, it interacts and it could take a month or a year or 10 years. I mean, all of our neurons have been alive since we we're born almost, but these new ones have to come up to speed quickly if they're going to be productive. Well, how could it do that? One way it can do it is to put the animal, maybe wear the animal, into a quiescent state, hit it over the head, let them vibrate, let all these things vibrate away. All of the circuitry vibrates. The cells are in a special mode. Newly minted cells are in a special mode that can listen to all the conversations around it and say, oh, okay, I see. I see how to, how to inculcate myself. I see how to participate. As opposed to having to take a, low, a slow learning curve it'll absorb it quickly. It may be in the course of a day or a week or a month, it becomes fully inculcated and becomes part of you and your personality. Uh, that is um, perhaps also, we have so many new memories that we have to store all the time, it might take a new neuron to come in, come up to speed. So what would it look like? Well, if you hit yourself over the head and you want to have all these resonances, that reminds me of sleep. In other words, you wake somebody up and all the important parts of, their per of, uh, of someone's personality and their thoughts and their desires and even psychoanalytic viewpoint can be thought of as resonating. And that's why you dream all these crazy things. They don't quite make sense. There's not such a narrative there, but it's what's important because what's actually taking place is boot camp for newly minted neurons. These new neurons are there and they're being told, all right, time to come up, up to speed. So that's the idea. It's testable. If you want to see a neuron that's newly minted, we know how to find them. We could then test whether it's in a special electrophysiological state that's willing to listen to the conversations around it and participate faster than it would have otherwise. So there's experiments that can be done and perhaps will be done. Thank you very much. Sure.